Hello and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Ivamy. And I'm Diana McCollum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of heroic television or film. And this week on the podcast, we are talking about Batman Begins. We're talking about how he started way back in 2005. Not when he started at all, but when Christian Bale started. When Christian Christian Bale and Christopher Nolan, the two British C's that we all the, that the we lovely, all know and love. The lovely Chris's that we don't talk about. <laughs> Yes. Christian probably goes by Chris. Christian, do no, do, I don't do think people Christian, named Christian go by Chris? I don't, yeah, I don't think they do. I feel like I'd call him Bale. Mm, mm. He does seem like a Bale, doesn't he? I mean, his last name's so short. Actually, no, it's he easy. seems straight up like a Christian. He, he seems like someone you would call Christian. He seems like he wants me to call him Christian, but I want to call him Bale. He seems like someone who like would go into a coffee shop and if he told them like my name is Christian and they wrote Chris on the coffee cup, mm. he would be mad. Yes, he would be. But he's also like a slightly mad man. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's 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 strange. He's a, <laughs> he's a strange boy, he's but he is got range. But he is also the Batman. He's also the Batman. So we're doing Batman begins this week. We did the Batman last week, so we're That's gonna right. compare these Batman origin tales. Yeah, and if you if you haven't seen the new Batman, the Batman starring Robert Pattinson. Uh, we are not going to be making any comparisons or spoilers or anything like that, so don't worry. Maybe you skipped last week's episode because you haven't seen the new movie yet and you're here to just chill and hear us talk about Batman Begins, and that's what it's going to be. We're going to avoid Pattinson comparison. We're not going to talk about the newer one. We're not going to compare or spoil. We're just here to have a good time and talk about Batman Begins. It's just two weeks about Batman, guys. It's just two weeks. Everybody it's the, relax. It's the dream. It is. It's two weeks about Batman. Batman. Mm. Batman. Bat it's it's Batman. Our favorite character from Batman Forever, you guys. I was about to ask if says, that was Forever or and Robin. I couldn't remember. I think it's Forever because I'm pretty sure Nicole Kidman is standing next to him when he says it. Yes, that's right. It's some yeah. kind of a ball and Batman smashes through the ceiling. Because it's Batman. And then some random extra <laughs> decided to go, it's Batman. Random With extra. He was definitely hired. He was auditioned. Uh, you don't just yell out a line and have it stay in the film. I'm actually going to say that that is an extra who shot their shot <laughs> and got a pay bump for it because it's the wildest line read I've ever heard, and I love it. So you didn't see the rest of Batman Forever then? All you right. think it didn't fit the tone? You know what? You got me. I you got, got you me there. Again. He was cast. That was he an active was decision. Cast. But it is a bold line read. It's Batman, but it's Batman. Uh, this week, as we talk about Batman Begins, one of the few like big, big comic book movies that we've never covered on this podcast. Yeah, there's only like a few on our list that are like huge ones that we have not gotten to yet. Tent and this poles. is tent pole is a great word. Hmm. Love it. We, <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet, so it's a it's. I honestly feel a lot of pressure right now. Really? Trying to be chill. Uh, well, you know what? Forget the forget Trying the fact chill. that I said tent pole. Oh, now I'm just thinking about fucking the Grayson's dying. Fallen in the circus. Oh wow, you went for you went for a big tent. Yeah, it's a big tent. Well, I mean, I'm on Batman Forever now. You're, we're all over the place. We're bebopping and scatting <laughs> There's all. There's so many Batman. It is. It's a good time. Uh, but with this, I'd say let's let's get right into it, shall we? Let's get into Batman and begin it. Let's begin. He has begun. He opened up a new Word document. It said Batman. He began. He began it. Uh, so this is this is Batman Begins. This is we've covered the the Dark Knight before on uh, on the podcast. We've talked a little bit about Bale's Batman. I think the Dark Knight kind of commonly accepted as Nolan's best of the Batman trilogy. Oh, very much so. I f feel like Dark Knight is considered the one of the best comic book movies, period. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's, it's in high praise. But we'd never covered this one before. Batman Begins. Diana, did you like it? I loved it. And I am shocked. Because I remembered this movie only being good. And I, like, watched it a lot when it first came out. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Schumacher Batman girl. And I liked it when it came out. I bought it on DVD. I'm sure I saw it at least, like, three times. But I think when Dark Knight came out, it became, like, that's a great movie and this one's just good. But this movie rocks. It's so much better than I remembered it. I mean, I haven't watched it for, like, 
over a decade, I think. I don't think, I think once Dark Knight came out, Batman Begins just kind of fell away. It's like, it's all Dark Knight from here on out. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it moves at such a great clip. It's so fun and charming. The action is good. I like Bale as Batman. The supporting cast rocks so hard. The mystery is fun. What we're fighting is fun. Watching him learn how to use all his gadgets and mess it up a few times is super fun. I don't even mind Katie Holmes. And I thought in my memory, she was like the worst part of this film. Um, I had a great time and I'm thrilled to find out I love Batman Begins. It feels like feels like finding an old friend that I haven't seen in, in a decade and being like, hey, you good? And they're like, I'm great. So I'm having a wonderful time with Batman Begins, but I also have so many things to goof about. So it's a perfect film. Perfect, absolutely perfect film. Andrew, did you like Batman Begins? I'm with you. I love it. Yay! I love it. I have a you lot of fun. I, I, I can't think of another Nolan film that I have this much fun watching. Because so obviously, fun. obviously The Dark Knight is a, a respectable and and iconic film. But this movie's fun. Batman Begins is fun. It is a nice blend of what Nolan wants to do and what a studio would like him to do. And I actually I really like that blend. And uh, I, I'm with you. It's a love. I think part of the reason, similar to you, I, I probably haven't watched this in a decade at least. It's not one you go back to. And I think part of the reason for that is simply because no one liked Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. It tainted the whole trilogy. Like, this is this is a good movie. Batman Begins is a good movie. Dark Knight is a great movie with some iconic moments and performances. And then Dark Knight Rises kind of fizzled which makes people really not think about this as like a trilogy they need to revisit. When people think back on like Nolan's Batman movies, it's like, just rewatch Dark Knight and you're fine. And no one really brings this up. I do think that in a different history, where even if that third film was mediocre to pretty good, this Batman Begins would be a movie people rewatched more and people would be like, this doesn't get the credit it deserves. Batman Begins is also very good. And I think that this would get rewatched more and get a lot more love if the third in this trilogy had landed. Uh, I will mostly agree with that. I feel like not even the third messes it up because I'm trying to think of other trilogies where like one of them is so good that the other two just never get revisited again. I think off the top of my head, I can think like Cap 1 is pretty good. But Winter mm. Soldier is one of the greatest movies ever made. Right. So people aren't like, Cap 1's a great... So people think Cap 1 actually kind of sucks a little bit. Mm. Um, but Cap 1 is really, really good. Captain America 1, for, yeah. uh, if I'm making it too short. And I think this falls into that a little bit of like, if you're going to watch a Nolan Batman, well, you're going to watch Dark Knight. Right. Because it's a film. Like, it's incredible. But like, you really should also watch Batman Begins. It's so much fun. I think what you said is right about studio interference of like, he wasn't powerful enough yet to say like I want to make the audio incomprehensible or I want I don't want any joy in it like he was he was not as powerful yet and that was to the movie's credit I, fully I would agree. definitely say yeah this movie is delightful I I I struggled with a change for an entire 24 hours because I enjoyed it so much mm -hmm. <laughs> even though there are things that even though there are things that you're right, we will goof on. There I are got so many goofs waiting. There are goofable things about this movie, but there's not one clear fuck up or one clear like, oh my god, you really got this holding you back. It is just like a lot of like, oh, what a little goof. But otherwise, a really great movie. Yeah, and all the goofs that I have are like, oh, that's a silly comic book movie thing, not like bad movie making I'm like let's make fun of comic book movies because that is literally my job mm -hmm. the comic booky elements of a film right yeah and I think also just like there's some stuff about the writing of this that is not even necessarily comic booky and it is just action movie from the early 2000s and a certain type of writing that we have moved past even in like popcorn movies uh, so there's some like cliched stuff in here that we're just kind of done with but we'll, we'll goof on that in a little bit to to start with just one of the great things about this is I'm, I'm with you I didn't remember this being a love for me I was very kind of surprised by it it's hard finding a change because the ball isn't dropped anywhere one thing that really stands out for me about this movie is how perfectly cast everyone is like you're right everyone talks about like Katie Holmes is like the real miss in this one and Katie Holmes, I will say, is the lowest bar of everyone in this. 
And even she is tolerable. Like Maggie Gyllenhaal is a huge upgrade, but Katie Holmes does fine and everyone else is absolutely perfectly cast. It is pretty damn cool how charming and likable and engaging every single actor is in this. Even Katie Holmes. Like, you know, it's it's weird that she only talks out of one side of her face when both sides work. It's a it's a thing right. I don't enjoy about her. But acting wise, like I believed Rachel. I liked Rachel. She was like a strong DA. I really like the choices the movie made about Rachel that were very subtle. Um, one thing we joked about while watching it was the fact that she has a shitty car, but she's not poor. She's just like medium level. Yeah, she's driving she's a like a real I, car. I think it's like a 94 Ford Taurus that's just this ugly green. And I'm like, yeah, just a practical, still running used vehicle. It felt very 2000. 2005 Gotham. Like, this is what a DA who's, like, making, like, okay money. She's not poor. She's not Bruce Wayne rich. She has a perfect level of car. I really like, like, some of the writing around Rachel as well. Like, I like that her mom was clearly Bruce's maid. But there's never any lines about, like, oh, you really pulled yourself up from the bootstraps and became a DA. Or, like, everyone just kind of respects her as a DA. And, like, it's never brought up that... She's like a maid's daughter, even though I'm sure the Waynes probably paid her great. Mm -hmm. The Waynes are very giving. So yeah, I, I like her performance. I thought was like absolutely fine. I think the media around the movie is why we think the whole like Tom Cruise thing with Katie Holmes oh, is why yeah. we think back of like she was terrible. But when you just watch the movie in a vacuum a decade later, it's yeah. Fine. Once you once you involve like Tom Cruise, a child in Scientology, the whole conversation about you as a performer becomes pretty toxic pretty quick. Uh, and it was also like just at a time when I'm not saying that uh, uh, paparazzi or celebrity journalism is crushing it right now, but I think that was like a certain level of peak toxicity in mm -hmm. the like late '90s, early 2000s, and uh, and yeah, a lot of the conversation kind of got wrapped up in that. Even though I think she's entirely adequate, I think that the things that are the worst about her performance aren't even bad performance decisions. They're just kind of funny and goofy. Like her having a bad trip on the fear toxin in the Batmobile is some of the most hilarious faces a human being has <laughs> ever made on, on screen in cinema history, like above comedies. Her face is fucking hilarious when she is tripping balls on scarecrow toxin. But it's not the wrong decision. It's not like you really failed as an actor. It's like, yeah, I've had friends have a bad trip and they look like a fucking doofus. I'm very worried for them, but they look like a dingus. She absolutely nailed it in that you have to go over the top in that scene because honestly, she's on fear toxin. And she's been put into the tumbler. A man in a bat suit is driving her around. Even not on a fear toxin, I'm freaking the fuck out in this situation. Just regular Diana. I wake mm -hmm. up in the tumbler. A man in a bat suit is shooting guns at the cops. I'm losing it. And on top of that, she's on fear toxin? You gotta take that to the 12th level of facial expression. Like, you want a more chill environment for your average day to day hallucinogen. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't wanna eat a, eat a mushroom and then be in this situation, let alone one that's guaranteed to be a bad trip. It's only possible effect is a bad trip. I wouldn't wanna take a Tylenol and go on the Tumblr with Batman. So she looks hilarious and it's very mockable, but it's not the wrong decision. So even when it's like very funny and she's the air quote bad one of the movie, bad performance of the movie, it's still fine. It is still, f everybody is fantastic casting. And I mean, obviously Bale and, and Oldman and a lot of, and, uh, and Freeman casting continues throughout the trilogy. But, ev but all of that right out of the gate works. Like Oldman is a great Gordon. Oldman is a great Gordon. He uh, he he is my standout. I want to go to my standouts. I abs I can't I can't decide if it's Alfred or Lucius Fox. They're both so incredible in a way I didn't remember. I remember liking both of these characters, but I just did not remember this incredible warmth, this incredible building of character, these instant bonds these characters all had with each other. Yeah, Alfred and Lucius Fox. To like, I want to watch their movie. Get Batman out of there. <laughs> So much Alfred and Lucius like helping Batman from the sidelines. They're so charming. And Morgan Freeman just getting it, just being like, 
I'm here to have fun and help Batman. I have no Morgan Freeman impression, guys. Everyone else in the world does, but mm. <laughs> I, not me. I won't put you through that, listeners. You don't have to hear my Morgan Freeman. You definitely don't have to hear my I, Michael Caine. I, Both two voices I cannot do. <laughs> I think what's really charming about that, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, try to breeze past so that you don't feel any pressure to do it, uh, because you've got a look on your face that's like, oh God, now I'm gonna have to, and you don't. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, Thank you. But what I think is great about uh, Freeman's Lucius and Ann Kane's Alfred and Oldman's uh, Gordon in relation to this Bruce is that, yes, they all have an immediate level of, like, camaraderie and friendship that clicks and it pops on screen. And there's something great about Bale's performance as Bruce and his relationship with these other actors is that they all feel, like, very different Forms of friendship and chemistry. Like, at no point does it feel like he has the same relationship with Lucius as he does with Alfred, even though they're all actors of the same caliber and, you know, the same, like, age discrepancy and a, like, a mentor-type figure, the potential. But it doesn't feel like any of these relationships overlap in any way, which, even though they're all immediate and sincere, uh, important friendships. And I think that that is a special kind of performance and relationship. Yeah, they found the performance, but the movie also, they found it in the performance, but the movie also makes it great because they all do have a different relationship because Alfred knows Batman and Bruce Wayne. Gordon only knows Batman. Lucius kind of only knows Bruce Wayne for Wink. most of it. Yeah, he Wink. never he never interacts with Batman directly just so he could pass a lie detector, it seems like, if ever he was lie detectored. Wink. wink. He's going to wink in his lie detector test. But yeah, there are different levels of friendship for all three of these men. And even if Alfred and Lucius both know Batman and Bruce Wayne, like, you know, Alfred raised Bruce. So that's a different relationship anyway. And Lucius is technically his employee. Alfred is too, but he raised him. That's a weird one. That I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to get into the weeds of Alfred. That's always a weird thing to talk about. But yeah, the, the relationships are clearly delineated, but so fleshed out. And even though they all only get a little bit of time, because that's like three full friendships that we see start to end in a two-hour movie, they still feel believable. Like, I believe all of these men trust each other and are doing their best and, like, will be there for each other. It's it's so fun. It's so nice. Like, you feel nice watching this Batman movie. I feel yeah. It feels weird that we're considered this the dark, gritty one, where I'm like, I was smiling for two hours. <laughs> I mean, dark, gritty compared to the Schumachers, I guess, which yes. came before them. When this came out, people were like, ooh, what a gritty interpretation. And now it's like, oh, it's pretty, uh, pretty it's tame. Even of its own movie. trilogy. Obviously, the second one, it goes to the to the darkest places. But, uh, but yeah, I, I really like it is all very delineated in terms of all of these relationships. And I kind of like this little, like, this little jigsaw puzzle of everyone's perception of Bruce and or Batman as well. Like this relationship that he has with Lucius where there's everything's unspoken. But that little exchange that they have where Lucius is like, don't treat me like an idiot and I won't treat you like one. Like he's like, we both know that we both know more than we say that we know. And it's like, let's both just be the smartest people in the room and shut the fuck up about that. And I love that back and forth because he knows, he's like, I'm not an idiot. I know that you're pretending to be an idiot. And then we have uh, Rutger Hauer as like the CEO of the company who's like, I think Bruce is an idiot because I'm an idiot. Mm. Then we have like Alfred who's like, I know you're an idiot because I think both of you are idiots. And like, because Bruce and Batman are it. So there's just like these like playful little, everyone has a slightly different interpretation and none of them are wrong, but they play off of each other really well. And it's something that wouldn't come through with lesser actors. Like two mm. two lesser actors could not do specifically, I would say, the Morgan Freeman and Christian Bale relationship. Yeah. They're, it's too charming. It's too many layers happening. It's too much wink and a nudge. They play it absolutely perfectly. Blew me away. And Michael Caine is the heart and soul of this oh, movie. Oh, yes, he is. Everyone's great, but like, I think the whole trilogy might not work without Michael Caine. Uh, I agree with you that like any other, any anyone else, if you replace them, it kind of fal falters a bit. This might not work without Michael Caine because he's such a like Batman is such a this Bruce and this Batman. It's such 
in every interpretation, is like a stoic, flat figure. But this Alfred completely injects him with love and life and warmth and makes him someone that us as the audience want to be a part of. Michael Caine manages to be both the heart and the comedy of this movie, which is incredibly difficult. Like, he is the heart when he's like, it's your father's name. Uh, it means something, and I'm going to defend it. He's the heart when he says other things, like, when do we pick your, why do we fall, Bruce, to, to pick yourself back up? But then he's also the comedy when he's like, why do you even do all those push-ups if you can't pick up a log? And Bruce is dying. Well, he's burning to death <laughs> he's under a log. burning to death. And he's just criticizing, like, do you even lift, bro? Basically is what Alfred says to him. Alfred as a stone cold bitch is my favorite mm. version of Alfred. You can borrow the Rolls Royce because he left him everything when he was presumed dead. Like, all of his lines are, like, so full of love and comedy and warmth. It is, he's incredible. Everything in this movie is so good. Yeah, no, no, nothing new here, but this just in, Michael Caine is a legendary actor who can do it all, apparently. Breaking news, the accent works. The accent works, and I think... Uh, Despite all the fa all the flack we give him for it. Yeah, everyone everyone likes to like make fun of Michael Caine, but it worked. I didn't realize that the, the line about picking yourself back up had like become Star Wars over the years where like we're misquoting it because everyone does the like why do we fall down when they're like when someone's like doing a Michael Caine it's like why do we fall down Master Bruce so we can pick ourselves back up but it's so we can learn to pick ourselves up again yeah. is the actual line which is way clumsier than the joke line that people attribute to this Alfred yeah it's weird how the public will just get to the root of a bat of a, of, of a clumsy uh. line quicker like we'll remember it cleaner yeah, yeah. And also, like, P's and B's just pop better with, a, like, a Michael Caine accent. To, like, yeah, to, like, to learn to pick ourselves up again is not as strong as pick ourselves back up. Like, it really, if you're doing a hammy too much, it really just pops way more with the made-up line. That makes a lot of sense. Also, uh, slightly on Alfred and Gordon, um, this, is how, this is how messed up movies have made me in the last like five years when they cut to a flashback that Alfred and Gordon were both in I was like wow they didn't de-age them <laughs> sincerely I was like wow the restraint they just let them have hair dye and that was it and it's like of course it's 2005 that's what we did with everyone and that's what we or, should keep doing they look they of course I believe they're just 18 years younger you dyed their hair yeah <laughs> why wouldn't I that. Why are we doing this to people? Why are we, why are we putting dots on their faces and giving them and, CG? And uploading them into the fucking face-off machine or whatever the shit we're doing. This movie's incredible and they just dyed their hair a little bit. Maybe they put some really thick foundation on and it works absolutely perfectly. And you're 100% right. I love that you're bringing this up because I wouldn't have thought to bring it up because it's so normal in this movie and you are right the normalcy is remarkable but yes as I was watching it when it cut to like the child Bruce Wayne who's in the police precinct and grown ass man Gary Oldman is just like it's me young cop Gary Oldman <laughs> and at no point was I like come on as I was sitting on my couch and I was like yeah, hello, 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 Gary, young man. Like, it is just a young version of Gary Oldman, and I accepted it, and I didn't care. I'm like, he's wearing a light blue shirt. This is a street cop. He's, like, 20 years old. They've made no effort to change Gary Oldman at all. And even to make Bruce seven years younger when they just gave him that bad young boy little floppy hair, yeah. even though he's supposed to be in, like, his fourth year of university. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Love Absolutely. So much easier, like... It's a movie who a man who dresses like a bat. I believe that people are young if you tell me they're young. Done. <laughs> it's all you need Done. to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to see any more dots on faces. Oh fuck, you are so right. You are I so right. I like that right. you I like that you saw the movie totally differently. Well, you were like, "Yes, that is young Gary Oldman." Because I saw it and I was like, literally was my third first thought in my head was like, "Wow, didn't de-age him." I'm like, "Of course they didn't." Fuck. 2000 Love they didn't they even did. know how yet. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, maybe? they could figure it out. They did it in one of the Hannibal movies. Oh, okay. Um, Red Dragon, because uh. it's supposed to be like a prequel, and they de-aged Anthony Hopkins. But like, but like, he wasn't allowed to move. 
Like, he right. just stands stock it's still. A, it's a still JPEG, a JPEG of a young Anthony Hopkins. Over his regular <laughs> face. He's only allowed to move his lips a little bit. But yeah, I love that they didn't de-age anyone. And for those those flashbacks, like the, the whole opening of this movie, I think, really works. For those flashbacks, I'm also very surprised how much I enjoy the kid who plays young Bruce Wayne. Because typically in like superhero origins and stuff like this, we've seen it a million times. And the child actors, frankly, usually aren't very good. Uh, and it's like, you know, I don't mean that to like insult the kids who are playing these roles, but kid actors typically aren't as talented as Sir Michael Caine or the adult actors that are in the film. How dare you? <laughs> so it's just that. And also, I just like don't normally kid care about the kid version. But this is one where I'm like, I like this kid. And this kid fucking pops on screen. When that kid has like the breakdown, it was like, it's it was my fault. I'm the reason they're dead. And Michael Caine is comforting him. Like that actually was a gut punch. And I think a very necessary scene because for the amount of times that we've seen like the murder of the Waynes as the like, we got to show the flashback. We got to show the murder gotta of the Waynes. Got to see the pearls break. Have you ever seen some pearls, pearls just break. fall down a sewer guy? Yeah, so we got to show that. We got to show that like there is a well with bats. But this I think is such smart storytelling to be like, okay, we have a man who is not going to cry, smile, wince, or show any human emotion. We need to humanize him and give the viewer some performance of those at some point in his life before he learned to suppress them. And I think that that is more important than seeing the murder of the parents. Like, you know, like to to establish who this kid is that pushes him to be the man he becomes. Yeah, I will completely agree with that. This, I love everything about the flashbacks. I like that the flashbacks take like these staples of Batman and really explore them. Like, we all know, as like, like Ed just said, we all know the Waynes get murdered outside of the theater. But Bruce being the reason they left early is such a nice extra level of why he's so determined to have revenge or, like, justice or, you know, become Batman. He does think it's his fault. Like, if they had just left the theater at the regular time, he might not think it was his fault. Mm. But he left early, and I like that addition. Um, I do think the kid's pretty good. Uh, no problems with the kid. I really like that they spent so much time with the parents. My parents, I should say dad. The mom got literally zero lines. Um, but I always, in a lot of Batman stories, I never really latch on to just like, my generic vague parents died. I really like meeting them. Like seeing that your dad was a good man who would carry you out of a well, who doesn't yell at his at his like servants when their kids get his kid stuck in a well, who like will help his son out of the theater and like console him and comfort him. Like, I see why you're so mad these parents died now. But when they're just kind of vague shape, please, shapes of parents, mm -hmm. it like it doesn't super get you. So I really do like they went back. They're like, he loved them. This is who they were. He felt guilty they died. I was like, wow, this works so much better than just I saw my parents get shot in an alley. Than just like the concept of my parents were murdered. Yeah. And a lot of the times it does feel like that's Batman's origin, where it's just like someone murdered the concept of All parents, parents were killed. Yeah. Your parents were killed. <laughs> exactly. And, and you, and you, everyone watching this movie, your parents were killed. But I would rather meet some people. Because mm. I don't feel like my parents were killed. Because we, we didn't go to the opera. And we, we wouldn't go in an alley. <laughs> Definitely. No. Um, so yeah, everything about the flashbacks. The kid was great. Meeting the parents was great. And it, like they did it pretty quickly. Like pretty economical for time. This movie's listed as 220. But 10 minutes of that is credits. It's only 210. Yeah. And it breezes. And it, and it moves oh, in a pretty good clip. Moves fast. Yeah. yeah. This movie was over in like a heartbeat it felt like. Especially for like all of the training. Uh, all of the training. Before he even like comes up with the concept of Batman. Uh, the, the journey that he goes on. Juxtaposed with these flashbacks to him as a child. And him uh, traveling the world and getting involved with gangs and ending up in a in a prison in a prison in Tibet. I can't remember if they said where they were, but uh, and then you know finding Rajah Gould and doing training with the League of uh, of Shadows. It moves really quick, but it doesn't feel like it jumps over any necessary information, and in fact, like gives just the right amount of extraneous information. You know, as 
you could just start this movie to be like, he went and did training and here he is, he's Batman. And that is also enough information. Some of the Batman movies do that. But this is this is maybe more than we need, but it never feels like more than we need. No, especially because the training becomes part of the plot. It's like really great storytelling of Ra's al Ghul is going to train you and then he will be the villain of this exact movie. And I'm like, excellent. So every time, everything, all the time we're spending with Ra's is completely relevant. This isn't just watching Bruce have a training montage. It's watching Bruce develop a relationship with the villain of this film. Mm -hmm. And so this it's tight. It's tight storytelling. It's really well done. It's it's so fun. And also like setting up in those training montages the things that they'll call back throughout the movie the as fear well. Fear toxins. And the like really good seeding of everything of of fear toxins of kind of why he becomes the man he becomes. The simple idea of like how to manipulate fear and theatricality and the fact that it is still very much Bruce's own interpretation of how to enact what he wants to enact, but it's his developing of the seed of ideas that the League planted in him. Like, for for Raj al Ghul to see him in the Batman costume and make that, like, half joke and be like, you took our thing about theatricality a little too seriously. But I do like that everything that is Batman is seeded in that little bit, but it is still made Bruce's own throughout the movie. Yeah, this movie does a really good job of showing him growing from being a student to his own man because, you know, we see that Carmen Falcone is like, you've never felt desperation, you've never felt crime. So he's like, well, I'll go feel desperation and crime and I'll show you. So he just kind of fucks off and he does whatever Fal Carmen Falcone says. And then Raja Ghul says, you need to come train in the mountains. So he comes up and he trains in the mountains. But then he finally is like, I'm going to do my own thing now. As soon as he's confronted with like, a thing you will not cross by Roz. Yeah. So he's like, it is, he's like, he does start off very young and he can't make his own choices and he does have very little agency, but the choice to be Batman was not what Raj told him, but he's like, I'm going to use all those cool tricks though. I'm going to use all those the smoke bombs and stuff. I'm going to use all that, but I will become my own man. So it does feel like you've seen his entire journey of childhood to student to teacher. Not yeah. that he just anyone just taught He's not a teacher, but he's taught. Yeah. <laughs> he's an adult. He's an adult. He's, he's an adult. A, he's he's, he's his a own man. man. He's a bat man, not a bat boy. All right. And uh, this whole opening, too, of uh, the, the other scene I really liked was the Falcone one. It is a series of scenes of people kind of unknowingly being like, here's why you need to become Batman. <laughs> but, like, the scene when he confronts uh, Falcone about having uh, – and I think this is even later in the movie that they flash back to that. Like, he confronts Falcone about having murdered – Joe Chill and taken away his yeah. revenge or whatever. And he's like, I've got nothing to lose. I'm not afraid of you. And Falcon being like, you are an idiot. You have everything to lose. It's like, oh, you're mad because you lost your parents. Rich people always think they have nothing to lose, but I can go after your butler. I can go after that friend of yours. And Bruce being like, oh, fuck. I need to not be me at all. Like that... All of these little proving grounds, it makes it feel like it it makes it feel like the natural conclusion to the movie is of course he had to become Batman. Not because we went to see a movie that's starring the Batman based on comic books that are about a character called Batman, but in a vacuum on its own, I'm like, well, there would be no other option for this human being other than to become a man who is now a bat. Like it seems like such a logical conclusion for the most insane concept of man. Imaginable. It genuinely does. Like, he gets people on board with this in a way that I completely believe. Like, Alfred being instantly into it, he's like, oh, great, it'll hide your identity and I won't get killed. Love that. Do, 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 I'm Alfred. I'm not dead. Don't want to be killed. Don't want to be killed. Lucius Fox just, like, being on board, even though Batman doesn't exist yet. But he's like, this b billionaire is going to do something weird. Yeah, Lucius Fox just being like, I'm one foot out the door. Fuck it all up, Bruce. Lucius Fox seems like, like, honestly, maybe a little bit petty at the beginning. And like he's like, I want to see if this billionaire fucking kills himself. <laughs> Won't be on me. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask what he wanted it for. <laughs> Spelunking. Yeah, let's see. Let's. I'm. I'm honestly hoping to fuck this whole company up. I'm pissed. Yeah, and like just the progression of like you have to be a thing you fear. You have to make them fear you. I'm like, well, it's only bats. Bats is you, the only thing you're gonna have to do. Bats. He can't dress up as his dead parents. So it's it's that or bats. The fear toxin made him see bats. That's definitely what he fears. He needs to confront that. And why? What better way than to be a bat? It's the obvious solution. 
it all all the clues are there. All the clues are there. To to do one like nitpicky negative about this movie that I don't necessarily love, and I think it is a bit of a product of the time, is that the the action is not particularly well edited. It might be well choreographed, but I can't tell. Like there is a lot of cuts in the fight scenes, even from like the like the brawl at the prison to like the fight on the train to him at the the docks when he's attacking people. It's very moody and cool when they do the like uh, the way they film the, like, mysterious shadows Batman. Like, there's two thugs, and then Batman comes from the ceiling and pulls one up, and the other guy turns around, and they're gone. The, like, I'm I'm in the shadows, and you'll never see me, Batman, I think is very well filmed and well shot. But when he drops down and starts punching fools, there's just a lot of quick cuts and editing and, like, no real geography, and, like, he's just throwing kind of loose elbows and if they did choreograph this well, I wouldn't know. That could just be Christian Bale just throwing loose elbows like a bad dancer, and they would just kind of cut around it. And I don't really see a fighting style or anything particularly interesting in an action movie anyway. I will agree with this. I think the I think the Tumblr chase is filmed quite well, but the actual fight choreography Car is, they do well. Car, car they do car well. They you do get well. the choreography you get mm-hmm. the geography. He's got like a radar of where the other cars in the street are, which is a nice little thing that you can you know what he's coming up on. He can jump off buildings. It's a fucking great chase. But yeah, I will agree hand to hand combat. I don't know if they just couldn't like film long sections because he's wearing the bat suit and they just were like we can only film three seconds at a time like he falls over he can't see to the left of him his neck can't bend yeah he's overheated like the stunt actor's overheating like we just cannot do too much we can't do a two minute straight fight scene we have to do it in sections maybe um because i do feel like the the mountain stuff was filmed a little better or at least or at least edited a little better like he's training montage he's fighting I the, do, I do agree like the it, thing with all the ninjas when he's trying to get raj and they're going into formations real quick is super cool It's super cool because it feels very practical like there's only a handful of edits and even as even as a viewer we're obviously trying to like keep track of 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 raj yeah. we're like where the fuck is he going yeah. and it's Actually, it's difficult. It is actually jarring and hard to deal with the movement in a very good way. They've done an excellent job. I agree with you. That is the one scene where I'm like, I see the action. I see the layout. I see the fight. Uh, it's really just that. And yeah, and that fight isn't in the bat costume. So I wonder if the costume what was messing up a lot of this choreography and making them over edit it. Because I agree, there's no great fight in the costume. Yeah, I wouldn't be there's able cool to. There's cool stuff with Gatling guns, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with the yeah yeah I with the grappling uh, grappling hooks yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. There's not like one cool like punch or move that I could like recreate or be like I love it when Batman did this. It's just. It's just some loose elbows. It's <laughs> the only thing he did that I loved, which I didn't want to do again, was when he just whiffed it and ran into the other building. <laughs> he like yeah. he oh the first he, when he, he after his first meeting with Gordon. Yet? Yeah. <laughs> he can't base jump yet, and he just fucking rocks himself on the building. Gordon would never work with this man. He he's do- trying to look like he's like so like it's like I'm gonna help Gotham. We're gonna do it together. And then to see a man just crank himself off a building, just I uh, yeet himself. Yeet is the word. It is a yeet. It is a yeet. Mm-hmm. It is a yeeting of yourself with so little control. It should be. Cool. It is essentially the scene from Rumble in the Bronx when Jackie Chan actually is a real human being, jumps from a rooftop onto a scaffolding, mm-hmm, and it's mm-hmm. insane. But uh, but somehow human being Jackie Chan did that better than the concept of the Batman. Well, human being Jackie Chan wasn't trying to be an impressive, mysterious man. Yeah, When that you're is trying true. to be an impressive, mysterious man, and then you go, ugh. <laughs> The, the groan is good when he makes the groan. I do like the groan. Yeah, like I really wish Gordon had, had some kind of line and when he saw him like base jump later, like, oh, you gotten way better at that, huh? You really <laughs> improved. You really whiffed it the first time. And <laughs> he really does whiff it hard. <laughs> like it's like the, Just it's eats like the it. fall at the end of John Wick when he hits like three Ooh, things yeah. in a dumpster. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, that dude's fucked. I'm yeah. not going to work with that guy. He's dead. Yeah, or or uh, Spider-Man 2 when he's losing Ooh, faith in his back. powers. Oh, my back. My back. 
So that's also a good time as well. That definitely happened. Yeah. Uh, so I like him see, seeing him be a goofball. And like, this is a lot of stuff from like the year one comic book as well of like him just still kind of like learning and figuring stuff out. I like the evolution of the gear and the equipment and kind of seeing him get everything from Lucius Fox and getting like a very practical kind of look into how all of this works and how he puts it all together. Yeah, it's really cool. Even just like very subtle things of like him using like the the little satellite dish so you can overhear people. He's like, oh, it doesn't fit inside my hoodie. So he's like, I'm going to put it in the ear of the cowl. And I'm like, oh, okay. So there's a headset in the ear of the cowl. I love that. I love ordering the two pieces of the cowl separately. Mm. Very small detail, but like really says like they're being very smart about this. Um, yeah, every every little thing it just makes sense. You're like, okay, yeah, he got smoke bombs from Roz. He got the suit from Lucius. He got he made his own helmet. And I adore this Batmobile. This is my favorite Batmobile. The Tumbler is. I'm going to say hands down my favorite Batmobile. I think it is the best of all worlds because it is not the, it is not the, even though I love the, like the Batman animated series that like sleek, it looks like a bat shit out of rocket. Like it's just an insane concept as drawing of a vehicle of like the Keaton, Tim Burton, Batman, the animated series, Batman. Uh, and then there's like the big like fuck you battle tank of like the Snyder films. Oh yeah, that one's uh, And it's like whatever. And then, you know, not to spoil anything for the Batman because it's on the posters and it's in the trailers, but he's got just kind of a very practical muscle car. So on the scale of like, like it, it is it, this triangle where like at each corner of the triangle it is fuck you tank from the military of Snyder. One is like cartoony idea of what if we strapped a rocket engine to a car. And then the other is a very practical version. This exists exactly in the middle of all three ideas of what the Batmobile can be. Where like, it's just militarized enough. It's just practical enough, but it's also just insane enough that it is not like anything I've ever seen before, but my brain can still look at it and understand that it is a car and how it works. I am so torn on the tumbler. I, ah. I, I, I love your enthusiasm. I'm sorry to, to dampen it. I, this is what I will say about the tumbler. I think it is a really, I think it is one of my favorite vehicles, like in terms of just like cars I've seen, like vehicles out there in the world that I've seen in movies. As a Batmobile, I do not like it. To me, a Batmobile is a flat car with a domed with a domed entry, and you it's not a tank. A tank is not a Batmobile to me. To me, a tank is a tank. Like this feels like he should have a smaller car, and this is like the special edition to fight somebody with a tank. Like I ran over Bane, I needed a tank. Okay. <laughs> um, so I I think the tumbler is really cool. Like I fucking love that he has to like go down into the console to drive. It's an it. insane thing to do, like, but it's like so Ra fun. Rachel is literally going insane with fear and he's like, I gotta go into the car. I gotta <laughs> go, I gotta get deeper into my car. And then when Gordon is like just shoved in there <laughs> by the car <laughs> it's so good. It's not too silly. It's like a perfect level. So I think the tumbler is really cool. I don't think it's a Batmobile. Uh, I'm not sure it's a mobile. I think it's a tank. I, I think it's way too mobile to be a tank. Like the Snyder one is a tank. Like it's guns everywhere. It is. But it's like flatter and it's to the ground though. Like it's, it doesn't have like the big chonky wheels. And even though it's big and chonky, like it even, even in like the way Lucius describes it, where he's just like, this is to like help transport infantry. Like it's designed for a battlefield, but it's not a aggressively designed for a battlefield. And I think that there is something about that that is so inherently Batman's aesthetic and design to be like, what is the biggest fuck you survivable design aesthetic we can create, but it's not based out of aggression or winning a fight, it's about surviving a fight, and it's about like transporting people and helping people, and something about it being like it builds bridges for infantry to transport. I'm that's nice, it's, and it explains why it can jump over buildings. Like they explain mm. things nicely in this film. And even though it's got that thick back end, even though it's got that Kyle Lowry ass on it, it's got a it's got a trunk. <laughs> it feels maneuverable to me. Like it feels more more practical than a a rocket ship than a like a 50 foot four car length long slender uh, sheen black with like a rocket engine on the back where it's like 
that's too long to get around corners and is Gotham all one big straightaway drag race. The the drag racer aesthetic I've never been super into. So I don't know. I love it. I love it. People have different loves of Batmobiles. I mean, if we're just listing favorite Batmobiles, I know that this is silly. Batman 66 is my favorite Batmobile. Fucking adore the Batman 66 Batmobile. That is absolutely perfect for that Batman. Yeah. Like there's nothing, there is not a spec to change for what that needed to be. And this, and the Tumblr like kind of matches this Batman. I just, yeah, it just doesn't feel like a car. I can't get behind it. Like, I'm sorry, Tumblr. Okay. I think you're a cool vehicle. I don't think you're a car. I don't think a, I don't think a fucking transformer could turn into you. I think I'd be like, that's still a transformer right now. It hasn't turned into a car. <laughs> it, it, it does look a little bit like a Transformer. I think that there is a certain charm uh, to it as well, like knowing that they built these. That, like these are function. I, I saw one of these at, at uh, Dundas Square one time. It yeah, with it's, one of them. it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. They work. They they're functional. So it's crazy that like this is the one where you're like, doesn't seem like a car. I'm like, they're driving these fuckers. Like that really. And I think they had like three. Like they had like one for like explosion stunts, hmm. one that actually could go fast, and one for just loose driving around or whatever. And like you know the Keaton one, it was I forget what type of car, but it's essentially a parade float. Like the Keaton one, it is it is a vehicle that they then put just a empty chassis that looks like a different vehicle over a pre-existing vehicle. But these are like custom built functional fucking vehicles. I love that you love that like you could get one. Yeah. You're like, no, it's not just like a fake Batmobile. This shit's real. You can get this. All right. Well, everyone's got a favorite Batmobile. I actually think we had this com- same conversation on Dark Knight like four years ago. Love the Batmobile. But moving on. We may move on. We, we may move on. I will say one of my negatives, and it's a joking negative, but I actually kind of believe this, is um, in the opening scene, it is very silly and pretty much against what Bruce is saying entirely. He's uh, he's he's faced with Raja Ghoul, who he thinks is Raja Ghoul, and they're like, you have to kill this man. He's like, I will not kill and then absolutely blows up that building and kills at least 30 men. Like, just absolutely explodes it. Because even he even admits that because he's, he blew up the whole building. He threw the, he threw the brand into the gunpowder. He blew it up. And then later he says, Raja Ghoul is dead. I'm like, so you know you killed Raja Ghoul. So you know you killed mm. everyone on that mountain? Mr. Hypocrite Batman I won't kill? Do you think when people die not literally from your own hands that isn't killing them? Like if you crash a train, the train killed him. Oh, the explosion killed him. Is that what you think do not kill means, Bruce? This is a Batman who definitely doesn't understand manslaughter as a type (laughs) of criminal charge. He does not understand manslaughter in any way. Just because I set off a- Or criminal negligence. Just because I set off a bomb next to you doesn't mean I killed you. You shouldn't have walked into that bomb. Right. Yes, I lit your house on fire. Yes, you were in it. But that's not a murder. So what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And I do also really like at the end when he he doesn't kill second Raj, Liam Neeson Raj, but he... He also doesn't tell Gordon that Gordon is about to kill a man. He's like, I need you to go shoot the shoot the subway down. And I'm like, so Gordon killed him because he's the one who shot the subway down. You've used Gordon as an instrument of death yeah. without his consent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wild. Gordon, I just need you to harm some infrastructure. No one's going to die, right? No, 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 no. Not no, by no, my no, hand, no. it won't. No, 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 no. I, I, I agree. This Batman is a, a murderer by criminal negligence slash manslaughter. For sure. For I, Around the time, like the Bale movies, I think, was when uh, uh, comedian Pete Holmes had a series of sketches called, like, Bad Man, I think. I think it was called Bad Man, yeah. yeah. And, and there's they one, were very good. There's one about him as being a Batman who, like, does not understand the concept of murder, where it's like, he's just sleeping. <laughs> like, yeah, there's blood he- coming out of his nose. It's a, clearly a, a, a hemorrhage in his You've destroyed his brain. No, deep sleep. Yeah, everyone he killed or knocked out, he was like, they're just asleep. But like, you know, he would like throw a batarang into someone's neck and they would be furiously bleeding. Just, there is a line, I they think, in funny. one of the sketches where like Pete Holmes is grabs one of the villains he had just murdered, is holding their gun and shoots an AK-47 at other ones. And Gordon's like, I thought you said you didn't use guns. And he goes, this is a gun. <laughs> like, does not know the concept of a gun. 
But that is very Nolan era Batman where like if I didn't see it, it wasn't my murder. Yeah, yeah. Even even though he definitely was the reason that whole building blew up. He did several murders he in this. He did do several murders. This movie also does something that I really like, and it is it will say something very silly and comic booky and move past it so fast that you don't have a chance to be like, that was very silly and dumb, wasn't it? Like uh like thing like people will just say exposition that doesn't make any sense, but like it makes the movie make sense. I'll give an example of They've just found out all these chemicals got poured into the water main, and there's some random scientist there, and Gordon's like, well, why haven't the drugs affected anyone? And the scientist just goes, it must be an aerosol drug. Why would you Why would you think that? Why would you jump to that? You don't even know what the drug was. You haven't looked into what it is. And, the, and then that scene is literally over. It's the last line in that scene. So you never have to be like, did he do a science on it? Did he figure anything out about what it was? It's like, no, we now accept the water needs to be aerosoled. And this movie does that like half a dozen times. Are you saying you like this or hate this? I like this. I, I hate You that. hate this! I think it was really fun. I think it like we overanalyze movies and I think someone not us just accepts it and it's cool and they, because mm. they get the exposition in there that you need. And they're like, we'd have to like have a much longer scene if we're actually going to explain why this random scientist knows it needs to be aerosoled. So we're just going to say it needs to be aerosoled. Right. It would be like a two and a half hour movie if they explained every dumb line in this film that they just cut away from. I get what you're saying. I don't think they need like to have long conversations about it. I think that these lines have always bothered me and it is something that was a very late 90s, early 2000s thing where like early 90s, 80s action movies, they were like, it doesn't make sense. Fuck you. No one's going to explain it. Just it, it, the thing explodes at the end. Keep up. And then... Popcorn movies and action movies became kind of insecure and was like, we need it to make sense, but also we have no faith in the audience. Mm. So there is a, like, we can't be subtle about it. We need someone to say it, but also clumsily written where it's like, we didn't write it into the main character's dialogue. And it just feels very sloppy whenever. And this really bothers me about like mid tier action movies of the two thousands. When we cut to a day player actor who is a named character, but not a name that we've ever heard on screen. Like, this actor auditioned for the, the character of, like, Dr. Emerald Lacoste, and I know my character's name, but it's never spoken on screen, and I need to say all of the exposition. I'm debutante Dottie, and I'm going to introduce Bruce Wayne to Raz al Ghul, and it's going to be very important, and then I'm going to walk away and pretend I didn't hear him say, I killed El Raz al Ghul. Ghul. <laughs> She's just like, doop a doo I set up the scene, bye. Like, they, it's like you can come up with, I think, smoother ways to have the lead characters do it, and especially, like, this third act is a bit of a mess, and it does that a few too many times, like, when it cuts to, like, just randomly, not... That one line from that scientist you mentioned where it's like, it has to be aerosol. And it's like, okay, now there's this, you know, ultrasonic thing that aerosols water that's on the train it's going through. And then it just randomly cuts to, like, the central hub water station, which is also in Wayne Tower, which we've never visited before. And it's two guys. They're like, we're, we're here at the central hub water station. We're in charge of it. It's all vaporizing and coming closer to here. And if it comes here due to pressure, it goes everywhere in the city. Anyway, we're in charge of the water. I'm like, who the fuck are you? Why are we here? That's That shit really bothers me, especially when it's a movie about a bat detective where I'm like, he could easily have a scene where him and the police, where like him and the police could be like, we need to stop it from getting to this place because, and we don't need to cut to a new location with new characters we've never met to just yell some random shit. Or let me throw this out at you. Lucius Fox is at Wayne Tower. He's telling Bruce, hey, the the water lines to Wayne Tower where I am and where I work. I'm in this building with the random day players who are saying these lines. Yes. <laughs> Lucius could have had all those lines. He could have been on the phone with Bruce. We have literally every possible exposition machine in our lead characters. We have a detective, a scientist, a, a lawyer. Yeah. So we have anyone who would like a detective, a scientist, and a lawyer can say the 
three most exposition heavy bullshitty type things because that is literally their job in this world. And but, then we have Batman who's all three of those things. Exactly. But they still give it to day player actors and I think it's just clumsy screenwriting that does that. All right. I get what you're saying. I won't defend the day players, but I will still defend the moving past it quickly. Mm. But yeah, the yeah, you're you're absolutely right about the guys in the water treatment center. Who were they? Yeah. Like we already knew, we can see the manhole cover shooting up. We know it's bad. We know it's fear toxin. We don't, and Bruce even said if it gets to Wayne Tower, it's going to explode. We don't need these random guys who, I don't even think they know what's happening. They're like, pressure. They, and it is, it is really a, a symptom of having no faith at all in the audience. Because not only do these guys have no idea what's going on, they're like, pressure, question mark? They have more information than they should. But once it's all over, the crisis is averted, the machine is destroyed, Raj al Ghul is dead, it cuts to these dudes in their office and they're like, ooh, wow, thank God that train exploded that for sure had the ultrasonic, like they, and like they don't have those lines. It just cuts to these guys and they breathe a sigh of relief and they're like, we're safe. To let the audience know we're safe and this, this act is over of the movie. But there's no reason for these guys to know this. Like, the city is still in the in the narrows, people murdering one another because they're on fear toxin. The whole infrastructure is fucked. These guys just watched a train explode. They have no idea why any of this is happening. Yeah, they why should... would they breathe a sigh of relief to let us know that this act of the movie is over? Yeah, these guys definitely should be like, we're going to get fired. We have so much work ahead of us. Also, people are dead. How am I going to get home? The train just exploded. I take that train home. Right. I'm going to have to walk. I take that to work. It to goes work. into the it building in. that I'm in. It's so convenient. It would yeah, be. Yeah, they they are unnecessary. And because you touched on it, we have to talk about the Narrows. This, this is, is the last thing I wanted to talk about. This is wildly unexplored. These people never get cured. No. An entire borough of, like, the Manhattan of... I th- of Gotham. I think it's meant to be, and like this version of Gotham, I think is an amalgam of a few different comic versions, which is an amalgam of different actual American cities. I think the Narrows is meant to be like Staten Island, I'm going to say. So what Staten Island is to Manhattan All right, that makes is sense. what the Narrows is supposed to be to this Gotham. I believe. Either way, an entire island slash borough was lost. Uh, Gordon's actual line is the Narrows are lost. Yeah. They never, they have no cure to give these people. Wild. What? And like, and also an entire subway line into Gotham also exploded. So like, like until you get to Wayne Tower, all that fear gas came A out. A chunk of Gotham still got fear gas. A and permanent chunk. because they even, they add exposition to make this worse. So they even have the thing where Batman's like, I need to cure Rachel because if I don't do it in a few hours, it's permanent. So we've now established you have a few hours or it's permanent. Then he has the vials of cure and he's like, Lucius, how long will it take to manufacture these? And Lucius is like, weeks. And then Gordon's like, the Narrows are lost at the end. So all of these people have gone completely mad for their whole life, including the random kid who gets way too much screen time as well. That's another thing that could have been cut from this movie. Mm. Uh, But like everyone is a raving lunatic who is on fear toxin. The random kid, most of the cops in Gotham. Yeah. We're also over there. Now, I will throw out at you, I've got a little bit of trivia for you. Uh. The official novelization explains the situation a little bit better. Shall I read? The official, please. The official novelization of Batman Begins gets into the situation a little bit more. Uh, In the official novelization, hundreds died. So hundreds, they admit, just straight up died. Some killed each did other. Die. They, di- mm. they died. They killed each other. They're on fear talks and they just died. Um, the rest were slowly cured over several weeks. They made enough stuff and they would just go in and cure people a few at a time. Um, so, But many people are completely insane and like a lot of them need therapy is like what the official, the official novelization got into it a little bit more. Hundreds died and the rest they slowly cured. Now I will say Rachel got, he said, a concentrated dose. And I uh-huh. think what comes up from the things is not as concentrated from the pipes. Okay, but you maybe. Like, but, like, he didn't say Bruce got a concentrated dose, and he was messed up for two days uh-huh. until he got a cure. Yep. And then... So, like, everyone in the Narrows and on, is still mega messed up. And on top of that, 
there's an extra vial that is the MacGuffin of the third act that they never do anything with. So when they manufacture the cure, it's like Bruce wakes up, he's already received his, so he's a scratch, it's done, don't worry about it. <laughs> then he is given uh, three other, I believe, vials. He has, yes, he has three. And he saves Rachel, yep. and he uses one of the three on Rachel. Then he has two left, the two only vials of the cure. And he hands them to Rachel, and he says, go into the city, Give one of these to Gordon for Gordon to take. And Gordon does. He takes one of the remaining two, leaving one left. And that man says to Rachel, he's like, and tell Gordon to use this to fix everyone. And it's <laughs> like, but how? No. And Rachel meets Gordon, and Gordon injects himself. And then we just never check back on Gordon or Rachel or, like, what the progress of curing is. It's just... There's just this mystery vial that's supposed to be the cure-all MacGuffin that no one does anything with. Yeah, they really did not know how to solve this problem in any way. Like, because they, you couldn't just, because if it took weeks to put the, the toxin in the water, they couldn't say they cured everyone with one vial. Um, that's not how it would work. So yeah, they, they really kind of just walked themselves into a corner and they made us as the audience kind of feel like the League of Shadows because they're like, don't even worry about those poor people in the Narrows. It's kind of the attitude of the movie. And I'm Gotham's like, Gotham's a little better now. It's like, what? No, it's not. They're just regular people who ha don't have money. One of them was a child that we spent too much time getting to know. Yeah. What? It's so it's pretty upsetting that the movie is like, don't even worry about those people. We saved Wayne Tower. I'm like. But all the people, <laughs> we didn't save them. It, it is the I think you should leave sketch where it's like, he's not even a real person. It was a homeless guy we killed. Don't even worry about it. Yeah, I, I actually feel like I would like it a little bit if they leaned into it of this is why Gotham's so weird from this point on. Because mm. right now there isn't a weird element of Gotham. There is no Joker. There is no like... Bane. It's just Batman's the first weirdo. But if an entire borough of the city got Joker gassed into insanity or Scarecrow gassed into insanity, it explains why from this point on there are henchmen and there are weird gangs and there are rogue villains. And if they leaned into that as the reason Gotham's weird from now on, it actually might be kind of cool. Right. But they don't. They just say, don't worry about those people. They don't matter. And those people, don't even worry about it. What a we mess. We had one extra cure we didn't even use. What an absolute mess of a third act. Yeah, they just it just cuts to Bruce like in his car on the phone. He's like, I saved the city and I bought Wayne Tech back. I'm like, thousands of people are dead or messed up. What Why is are going we celebrating? On? What is happening? This is a total loss. <laughs> Raja Ghoul did a pretty good job. It's upsetting. Yeah, uh, I think, and, and also too, like him cutting to like the next day to be like walking in on a meeting at Wayne Tech to be like, our initial public offering went great. There is no scenario it did. Your train blew up at your headquarters <laughs> and you lost a borough of your city. In no scenario is that company doing well today. Actually, let me posit this. That's why Bruce was able to buy it outright. Right, to buy up all that stock due to the absolute crashing stock price. Was this all manipulated by Bruce Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> this he was crashed, just fixing the market he, was the whole plan? He crashed the stock of his company so he could buy back his company with the, with the price of his existing stocks. Uh-huh. Honestly, yeah. it does sound like a plot it, in a Batman movie. It does sound like a Batman plot. I think I've seen it. I think I've seen it in movies. Yeah, a little stock manipulation to get his own company back. Sure there, batty boy. You do what you got to do. Oh, yeah. And I also didn't care that he, like, lost the company, got the company back. That didn't seem like it mattered. No, it wasn't that big of a deal. It, it was just like, it was like, oh, Rugger Howard's cool is, and, and good at this part. It's cool that he's here. It's I, cool forgo that I forgot that he was here, but another, you know, another get, another great piece of casting. Yeah, it's cool that Lucius gets, like, upgraded, but you could have just done that. If you were always in charge? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so yeah. Well, I'm feeling good on Batman Begins. You feeling good? I'm feeling good. I want to I wanna watch it again. I, I feel like I owe Batman Begins an apology. It's a fun movie. It's so much better than I remembered it being. Yeah. yeah. It felt nice. It did feel nice. It felt really nice to watch. It's 
It felt so lighthearted and nice for what everyone was like, it's the dark Batman. And it's, I think that this is as playful as Keaton's. It is as playful as Keaton's. I 100% agree. Like looking back, you know, I mean, we're not going to, I'm not going to get into it, but like the Batman is dark. The new one. Yes. Yeah. This one is regular comic book movie. Yes. This is a dark, Marvel film. And like you know, Dark Knight, Dark Knight is Dark. Dark Knight is Dark. That is Dark. That's as why well. they changed the title, the sequence of the names. Yeah. yeah it yeah. is not Batman Continues. It is, it is a new thing. It is, yeah. We're we're fucking going off now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think Rises I only ever saw once, but I think they tried to be dark and maybe weren't successful. I, think I also only saw it once. Mm. Which is well, wild for a movie that technically had a Robin in it. Let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? So now that we've discussed everything we've discussed, what would you change about this movie if you could change anything? But before we do ask the final question, we want to remind you, our listeners, as we do every week, uh, please take a minute to uh, rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Some other third, fourth place. Whatever you're listening to this, I bet there's a way. Pick a thing. Uh, Some of you listen to this uh, just kind of like weekly. You wait for the tweet or social media or you go to our website. You hit download. You're just kind of doing it as they show up. That's cool. We appreciate you listening. But hit follow on some kind of a podcatcher app, some some app of some kind, because then it's going to be there waiting for you every week. And also it just helps us move up the charts and be seen by more people. Every app has an algorithm and the more people that follow something, the more people that rate something, the more it's going to put it in its noteworthy and it's recommended in the TV and film category, the more we get seen by new people. And also if you leave a review, it makes us happy. It warms our hearts. When someone new finds the show, a lot of the times people do check reviews and that has an effect on whether or not they become a listener or think that this show is actually going to be worth their time. Guys, our podcast fate is in your hands. People trust you if you leave a review. They do. They do. Please help us. Help us. And do it for a couple of your favorite podcasts in your life while you're out, while you're doing it. You know, it's going to take a minute to do. So why not take like three minutes out of your life? Be like, what are your three or four favorite podcasts Open up an app, leave those three, even, you know, even if it's, you know, not all of our network, whatever it might be, pick some of your favorite podcasts, leave them a nice rating and review. It'll be a few minutes. And then in the future, you'll hear these little spiels at the end of podcasts and you'll be like, I'm good. And then feel free to hit, hit that skip forward 30 second button, you know? And I'll tell you this, guys, you're going to feel really good after you do it. You're you going to be like, oh, I did a good deed today. Free, easy, good deed for the day. Hell Yeah. And also, if you want to get bonus episodes of this podcast, you want to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash from superheroes. It's a monthly subscription service where you can subscribe at whatever level is in your budget. You can do a buck, five bucks, 10, 20, whatever it is you can afford. You're not locked in. You can cancel or change on any given month. If you do sign up, however, at the $10 hero level, you get access to the monthly bonus exclusive episode of the podcast. You'll get immediate access to the back catalog. And this month on the podcast, because we have been, uh, we were just talking about Robert Pattinson's The Batman last week, to continue a Pattinson, we are doing the first Twilight movie that will be available this weekend on the Patreon page. And then uh, next week on the public episode, we'll be doing Twilight 2 as well. So we're so much Pattinson, so many vampires. Also, Morbius is coming out, so it's a nice weeks, combo. So it's of- a nice combo of Pattinson to, to vampirism. We're, we're, we're building it up. So this weekend, that'll be available on our Patreon page, the Twilight, first Twilight movie. Uh, whichever one that's called. I think it's just called Twilight. Is that one just Twilight? They just did, Twilight. They didn't have confidence they were going to no, get more. No colon, nothing. All right. So that's going to be up on our Patreon page this weekend. Uh, check it out, patreon.com slash from superheroes. Even if it's not for the, the bonus episode, even if you can kick in a buck or whatever just because you want to be nice and you're a cool person, check it out. And also, if you know you're going to stick around, you can get a yearly subscription and get a month free. Boom. If that's a thing you're into, but that's only what's in the budget. Oh, and don't strain yourselves. At patreon.com slash from superheroes. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash from superheroes. And now, to ask the final question of what would you change, Diana, what would you change? Um, I have like a little one and then I have a big one. What will I start with? I'm gonna start with the big one. Mm. Um, I'm gonna fix the narrows. 
we're not going to sacrifice an entire borough of Gotham. Um, actually, they kind of go together. So, no, I'll just I'll stick with this one. Um, <laughs> I'll, lay it on I'll me. I'll start where I'm starting. Lay start. it all on We're going to fix the Narrows. Um, basically, we are not going to sacrifice the Narrows, and the machine isn't going to turn on until it gets to Wayne Tower. Mm. So Batman knows the machine's on the train. Rachel sees it when she's in the Narrows, and she's like, hey, Batman, the machine's on the train, but it's not going to turn on until it gets to the hub. So the Narrows don't get fear-gassed. The whole way to the Wayne Tower doesn't get fear-gassed. If we don't have a way to cure these people, we're not fear-gassing them. I'm sorry. We have all these inmates who are free from Gotham or Arkham. That's enough of a threat. Like, literally every Arkham inmate is out. I think that's enough of a threat to deal with. Um, so I, I would like to not sacrifice the, the people of the Narrows. So the ticking time bomb is don't let it get to Wayne Tower or else then all of Gotham will die from the, from the guess. Mm. Um, and then my smaller change that I really wanted was I, despite how funny her faces were in the Batmobile scene with Rachel, I think it was really rude that it's still very scary and she's dying of fear gas. I really wanted him to take his mask off and be like, it's me, Bruce, you're okay. And I think this is the moment you have to tell her you're Batman. Like, she's dying of fear. You can't be a scary Batman. You have to be her friend Bruce, <laughs> who is talking her down. Like, literally, it will save her life if you tell her you're Bruce Wayne and she's safe and you are not a demon of the night. <laughs> and then you can actually, like, talk to her in the cave. She can just leave your house. She doesn't have to be carried unconscious by Alfred. <laughs> and like I think she could like spot Raj at the party know that Raj is evil see him in the Narrows later like it'll all come together a little bit better so save the people in the Narrows and uh, Rachel uh, gets to find out in the Tumblr that Bruce Wayne is Batman <laughs> to try to save her sanity <laughs> uh, those are my two changes Andrew what would you change? Uh, I love that. I'm definitely on board with both of those changes. If I could piggyback off of one for a second. This, oh, this, this wasn't what I had pre-planned, but talking about like saving the Narrows, it occurred to me that I'm like, it would be better if Bruce put the vaporizer on the train. Uh, oh, to get it out of there. To get it out of there. Or I think the other option is instead of having like, instead of having Lucius be like, it's going to take weeks to synthesize a cure, just have him have cure. Have Br and then Batman puts it in the water supply the same way that they administered the toxin to begin with. Then for Bruce to vaporize it, he puts the vaporizer on his train and drives it through the narrows and the poor area of the city using his father's infrastructure that was designed to get access to the poor and needy of the city to get access to the poor and needy of the city rather than destroying his father's infrastructure. Mm, he did destroy his father's infrastructure. Like, they're not yeah. rebuilding that subway. So I'm, I'm with you on on saving the narrows. Uh, I, love, I, I love revealing to Rachel in the scene. The other thing I really uh, would like to change is I think we need to seed in the change of Wayne Tech earlier in the movie. Uh, and have that kind of go through. So like near the the ultrasonic vaporizer comes out of goddamn nowhere. It is like an hour 40 into the movie. It cuts to Rutger Hauer and he's just like, we make weapons now. Shit, we lost one. And it is, it is giving me whiplash. It all happens too quick. I would like it if he abandons his company, Bruce. He's training. He's over there and he joins a gang to kind of learn from them. But he's like, secretly, it's not a crime because I'm stealing my own stuff. I would like it if when he stole his own stuff, he thinks it's going to be your average Wayne Tech stuff, maybe computers or shit like that. And he opens a container and he finds weapons, missiles. And he's like, what does my company come become while I left? Like, I, I need to go back now. Mm. And that is the inciting incident for him to be like, I need to go back and change the direction that Gotham has gone in. He's like, I came here to train. And I'm like, I and had the attitude of like, I'll go back when I'm ready and I'll do something eventually. But if he, in that exact scene of stealing his own merchandise, realized his company had shifted to weapons manufacturing secretly, would be a great reason for him to go back and be like, I need to get back in, get in my company, find out what's going on in my city. And it would be a great reason for Raj Al Ghul and the League to recruit him and be like, no, 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 you're not ready. Don't do that. Don't mm. do that. Until that they can get him on his side. I really like this because it also, I feel like I completely like forgot that they switched to weapons and like that's kind of why Bruce wants to be in charge again, I guess. Like it would explain like the fight to be in charge, why he's buying the stocks back. I guess there is a little bit of me that's like, 
But you want them to make weapons. You took the tumbler and the, and the fucking suit and the bombs. But, uh, but he doesn't want them to make weapons. That would be a great reveal and a great impetus for him to get back to Gotham. I really love that. Yeah, yeah. finding out. Yeah, that would make everything at Wayne Tech so much more justified. Like, so much, like, he has to get in here. I have to go back. I have to shut down the weapons manufacturing. A little, like, Iron Man-y, but he's before Iron Man. This yeah. is pre-Iron Man time, guys. And I think it makes the second act more of a present mystery. Because as it is right now, I think one of the things that is strange is that it's definitely meant to be a reveal that Raja Ghul is alive when he shows up at that party. But it is just a middle act where Batman sincerely is an idiot who has no idea what is going on and has no idea that a betrayal is coming. And he's not someone who's suspicious but hasn't pieced it all together yet. It is someone who straight up has no idea that Raj al Ghul in the League of Assassins is about to blow up his, about to wipe his city off the map. I think that's great. I would also add maybe they steal it from Wayne Tower and not a random boat. Mm. So we could actually like know it's missing and he could be like the inventory's off or something. Like why was it on a random boat? I don't know what the boat thing was about, no. That's a, it was a bold choice. It was a bold choice. But yeah, have him, have him in that opening scene where he's robbing Wayne Tech stuff, find weapons. And that is the impetus for, I've got to go back and save my city. And it's also the impetus then for Raj al Ghul to be like, don't do that. I need you on my side. And why he tries to recruit him. I love that change. Wonderful. We've done it. We fixed a great movie. We did it again. We always do it. It's, We're so good. It really is something we consistently do. Well, that's going to be it for this week on the podcast. We are going to be back next week talking about Twilight 2. <laughs> just saying it. <laughs> just saying it out loud because... Uh, What's Twilight 2 even called, you we, know? I don't know. I We know nothing about Twilight. So it's going to be fun, though. So we, since we just did Pat, uh, Robert Pattinson on the podcast for last week's The Batman, and then also in two weeks we're doing uh, Morbius. So it's a nice... It's a nice Pattinson vampirism combo. We are doing Twilight 2 next week on the podcast. And if you want to hear the build up to that this weekend on the Patreon page, we are going to be releasing our episode on Twilight 1. So uh, that will be up at patreon.com slash from superheroes. So if you check out patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash from superheroes this weekend, you can check out our episode on Twilight 1. Next Monday, we'll have an episode on Twilight 2. Then it'll be Morbius. It's going to be a fun time. And we'll see you next week for whatever the second Twilight's called. And, uh, we'll look it up. We'll look it up. We'll, by then, we'll have looked it up. And if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach me on Twitter at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. You can reach me at Words of Diana. And you can reach both of us at From Superheroes. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.